Okay, so the year is what? 1989, 1990, 1991, 23, 4, 5, all the way to 2000. In that time frame, those of us that were around high school soccer at that time remember that um, there was, it was a different media day and age. Uh, we were covered by the newspapers, not as much as the high school football and basketball, but we got good coverage, decent coverage. When our team, CCC, won the state championship, I don't know, 89, 90, I think 90 maybe, our, the headline, the top banner headline of the sports section, page one, top headline was the fact that our team won the state championship. This is something that <clears throat> was cool. I mean, usually the top banner headline is reserved for like a Bucks game or something. And, uh, you know, that was, that was an example of uh, the kind of attention that was paid to our great sport of high school soccer. As time has gone on, we all know the story. Uh, the media has pulled back the talking about the newspapers, the local newspapers have pulled back because of, you know, the, the normal reasons that we understand. Right now, the Tampa Bay Times is only delivered to people's houses two times a week, and you won't find anything about soccer in there. Uh, they do cover high school football and high school basketball, and but uh, high school soccer is just gone like it just disappeared, like it doesn't exist anymore. And that has been a slow uh, move in that direction through, you know, the 2000s, the aughts, as they say, and 2010s. Okay, so myself observing all of that, you know, I'm, I'm like, like a lot of you, um, most of you, probably all of you, I would think, are like, this is not right. You know, there's an injustice here because kids uh, in the 90s, 80s, their parents could read about them in the paper. Now they can't. Okay. So uh, what can we do about that? Is it important? Is it even so, you know, who cares? What? That's, is that why we're doing high school soccer in the first place? Um, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you have to have that internal uh sort of conflict within you, which all of you high school soccer people have to have, and you resolve it and say, no, it's not that important. We don't do it just to get in the paper. We do it because of the, reason, the reasons we do it, which is whatever they are. Everybody has their own reasons for doing it. And, you know, if, uh, if it hinged on uh, just getting in the paper, it would have died. It would have died out, but it hasn't died out. Uh, high school soccer is like... Uh, <laughs> it's like you just can't kill it, right? The clubs have tried. The clubs don't like high school soccer, but I'm, that's another story. I don't want to get off in that direction. So let's stay focused on the media coverage. Okay, so then we get to um, about 2015. It starts festering in my head. I was at Carrollwood Day School by then. It starts festering in my head. You know what? There's an injustice about this lack of coverage of high school soccer. And something should be done about it. But what? I don't know. Right? So somewhere, somewhere along the line, it occurs to me that, wait a minute. Um, what if we just start a Facebook page? Okay. Well, before that, it, it, uh, it, before that, let me back up a little bit. The seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Something I believe in. Like a lot of people do, a lot of you do probably. Whether you identify them as the seven habits or not, you, you are living them because it's just how you live your lives. Habit number one is be proactive. Um, and being proactive is something I try to live by. And so I thought, okay, what can we proactively do to address this problem of a lack of coverage of high school soccer? What can we take into account, into control of our own? The other thing, uh, the other idea is the circle of concern and a circle of influence. Uh, two concentric circles, if you can think of them like that. And the, the inner circle of the 
um, concentric circles is the circle of influence. The outer circle is the circle of concern. The circle of concern is all the things you're concerned about but can't do anything about. The weather, for example, is a great example of something that's in everybody's circle of concern but not in their circle of influence because no one can control the weather as much as they might like to make us think we can. We know that we can't. Okay. But the circle of influence are things that you can, you know, that you can do something about. And you should always operate within your circle of influence. So <clears throat> I'm thinking about this problem of, you know, the coverage of, of high school soccer. Operating within my circle of concern, if I was operating there, I would try to convince the newspapers that they should cover it. And when they don't, throw my hands up and say, oh, what are we going to do? I can't do anything about it. But if we were to operate within our circle of influence, just doing things that we can control. So, okay. So be proactive, circle of influence. Okay. Now, somewhere along the line, it just occurred to me this thought. If they're not going to cover us, we'll cover ourselves. And how can we do that? Because of everybody's a journalist now. Everybody has the ability to do like what I'm doing right now with this video and to take videos to open up blogs or, you know, YouTube stations or Facebook pages, right? And so it just kind of all came to me at once. Why don't we do a high school soccer Facebook page? High school soccer coaches Facebook page. Why? Why coaches? Because then we can make our own news and cover it ourselves. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Whoa. If we, if we, okay, how would we do that? Well, here's what we did. Kind of thought it through. Rob Nugent, Brian Nugent. Uh, did a lot of this thinking with me and um, and we kind of figured okay if we start a Facebook page and we invite coaches we limit it geographically I'm, I'm kind of going fast now to the three county area of Pinellas Pasco and Hillsboro and we there's reasons for that which can be we can talk at another time about that but if we uh, <clears throat> if we ask coaches to vote on who they think the top 10 teams are in that three county area, then we can collate those votes and then boom, we have a, a, a list. Everybody loves lists. Everybody loves top 10 lists. Everybody loves polls. The quote number one ranked team. That's always a, a big thing for everybody. It's a big thing for me. I love those things. So I thought, wow, this is something. So I uh, started reaching out to my brethren, older coaches like myself, people like Rick Macy, and, uh, you know, you guys know who you are. And uh, what do you think, guys? What do you think about this? Yeah, it's a great idea. Let's do it. Okay. So uh, then I, um, I thought, okay, how do we do this? How do we do this? And, uh, my first thought was identify key coaches to get their opinions. And those key coaches would be the ones that would everybody would look to as like the elder statesman and whatever they say, that's what is. Because now I'm thinking about it being how it's going to be perceived. But I'm thinking, wait a minute, if we did that, if we just had key coaches, uh, even if they did a great job, they would be open to people saying, that's not fair, they're just voting for their friends. So the only real fair way to do it is to open it to any coaches that wanted to participate. But that was even, that was easy to do because of email. Um, we could just send it out to every single coach and say, look, we're gonna vote on top, top 10 teams. If you wanna vote on it, come on. If you don't, that's fine, you don't have to. But that takes off the table the argument of it being unfair. If it's accessible to everybody, then you can't argue that it wasn't fair if you didn't participate. Um, now, if you participated 
and then you might have an argument that it might not be fair, but that's a different argument. So leaving it open to everybody, of course, uh, as we all know, that means that um, not everybody, you know, is going to take up take up arms and uh, not everybody has time to. Not everybody has an interest in doing it, but not everybody's going to do it. But some are. And we don't need everybody to do it. We just need a sample. Um, you know, in polls, in political polls, they'll tell us who the favorite is for president, for example, because they spoke with 1,000 people in a country of 330 million people. About 1,000 people by that sample, we're not going to tell you who who's leading the race for president. Well, those odds are kind of crazy. I mean, if you really think about those odds and you apply them to a poll, we'd only have to get one coach to uh, weigh in. But if we can get 10 coaches, well, that would be fantastic. Uh, we went around and counted the number of high schools. I think there's maybe something like 75 or 80. So uh, let's say we got 10 coaches out of 70, let's say, right? That's one in seven. Uh, what is that percentage? It's like 14. But if you took a poll of 14% of the American public, you would be asking, what is it, 350 million people in America? So you'd be asking more than 30, almost 40 million people. I don't know. That's back of the envelope math in my PE teacher head, uh, which is probably wrong, but 40 million. Have you ever seen a poll with 40 million people? Never. I mean, it's like laughable. So if we could, I mean, laughable, people would say that's almost like an election. If you had that many people voting, just have the election, right? So if we could get 10 out of 70 or 75 or 80 coaches weighing in, that's a, that's a great sample, right? That's a great sample to be able to actually say, okay, here are, um, here are who, you know, who are reasonable smattering of coaches believe here are who they believe are the best teams and then if the if the ballots come in and they're relatively close we don't expect every ballot to be the same but they should be fairly close to one another right so then you know that you're on to something okay so we thought okay summarizing going back make a list top 10 teams post it on a facebook page that you start get a Twitter account, which we've done, but I've never learned how to use. And now we're trying to find the, the uh, now we're trying to find the um, password for it because Carlos is really going to hammer that Twitter page. It's there. Maybe we'll have to start a new one. Who knows? But anyway, uh, I'm getting sidetracked again. Twitter page. Uh, Instagram. Uh that's the one I was talking about, Instagram. I don't know how to get on that one. But long story short, um, okay, let's see what happens. Because I've spoken with everybody. Now, for me, my problem was, this is going now into the 2017-18 season, all this is happening. And I'm thinking in my mind, when the heck am I going to do this? Because at the time, of course, I was a full-time teacher and... Then I was working at West Florida Flames Soccer Club after school, doing my summer camp, which is more than just the summer. It's, uh, you know, it's really a year long thing where you're administering, you know, keeping up with the website and, you know, registrations, getting campers in, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, by the way, coaching a high school soccer team in that, that time of year. So when am I going to have time to do this? Because my day usually was... Uh, leave the house at 7, pack a lunch and a dinner, uh, you know, go teach, then go to, during high school season, go to high school soccer, then go to club soccer, and then come home about 9.30 and wake up the next day and do it all over again. There's no time to do this, right? Usually I'd wake up around 5 just to give myself a little time, right? Give myself a little me time. So I said, okay, there is time. What if I just wake up at four? No, I've created an hour that didn't exist before. 
So if I'm really committed, this is me talking to myself, if I'm really committed to this and willing to put in the effort, then that's what I'll do. So I did. I started waking up every day at four um, and creating an hour that wasn't there before, devoting that hour to this idea of if we can't, if the papers won't cover us, we'll cover ourselves and getting that off the ground. So that's what, that's what happened. And we got that first thing going and it was fantastic. You guys know because you guys all participated or, uh, one way or another, whether you were voters or just watch the poll or whatever the case may be. So we got the poll going. That was very, very exciting. Okay, I don't remember when or where or how this happened, but the next thing was, it occurred to me at some point that uh, probably when I was watching a Champions League game that uh, the Champions League, wait a minute, we have district champions. We can have a high school Champions League. Why can't we have a high school Champions League? Started thinking about that. Started thinking that whole thing out. How would that work? Making a long story short here. Uh, maybe one day I'll just make one of these videos to talk about specifically about the Champions League and how the evolution of that went. But uh, got the Champions League concept. Uh, wrote it up, sent it out to lots of people, asked for feedback. Uh, it seemed that a lot of people liked it. I don't remember anybody saying this is a bad idea. I don't remember anybody saying that, uh, no, you can't do this. I do remember people saying, I don't know how you're going to do this. But th that wasn't a no. That was just, uh, you know, just it's going to be tough. Uh, so, okay. So to make a long story short, we got the Champions League up and running. Okay. I was at Carrollwood Day School at the time, and just in thinking about first round games, I figured they could go on people's individual schedules, which is what we did and what happens now. You make a group, you pull, you pull a four team group, and now you have three other teams, and that's who you play in the early part of your schedule. You have to play somebody, right? As far as uh, seeding and who gets the home game, who gets the away game, we can talk about all of that, but I kind of thought all that through. But then you had to get to a final four, right? And where would that happen? How would that happen? So I went to the Carrollwood Day School administration and I said, here's, here's the idea, and I'd like to have this be a Carrollwood Day School every year, uh, and turn it into a big soccer event, uh, turn it into a big weekend, where not only could we have semifinals and finals, but we could have a big soccer social for high school soccer coaches, something cool. Because nobody gives the high school soccer coaches anything, except a lot of, a lot of uh, lack of respect. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had many conversations with you guys uh, over the years, and I felt it myself. I've worked in clubs. I know how high school soccer is thought of in most places. It doesn't need to be. It shouldn't be, but it is. And that's, that's the club's problem, not high school soccer's problem. But anyway, so you guys never get anything. You never get a fuss made over over you. You're out there doing a great job. The media has turned its back. And the clubs, which those of you those of you that are old like me, you know that it was the clubs themselves that insisted that high schools take up high school soccer. I'll bet you guys didn't know that. Uh, talk to some of the older guys, and they will tell you about the campaign in the late 70s, early 80s, like the right around the turn of the 19, right around 1980 or so, that club soccer led the way uh, with the pitchforks, you know, at the at the school gates to to make sure that soccer was represented in high school athletic programs. The clubs were leading the way. Yes, and uh, so you know, the natural question that athletic directors had was. 
how is this going to work? If kids are playing on club soccer teams and high school soccer teams, and they're trying to get good grades, how is this going to work? And the grand bargain that was struck was the split season. And, uh, you know, high school soccer would, I mean, clubs would shut down in the fall. And so the high school could take place and then clubs would pick it back up for the state cup. Okay, high schools were on board and it went into the high schools. But now, as you know, that grand bargain has been violated uh, many times over by the clubs, the very, the very organizations that uh, initiated this high school soccer in the first place. So the clubs, you know, they don't respect you. Uh, they just don't. Uh, they, they may respect some of you individually, um, you know, but I, I think as an institution, high school soccer is not respected. So <clears throat> back to my Champions League Final Four thing. So I was thinking, let's have a big special day for just high school soccer. Let's have it at Carrollwood Day School. Doesn't have to be at Carrollwood Day School, but at least at Carrollwood Day School, I could guarantee a great venue, uh, a great, uh, you know, way, a great professionalism in receiving the coaches. Carrollwood Day School does a great job of, um, you know, rolling out the red carpet and putting on events. They're really good at it and they have good facilities for it. A really beautiful auditorium and just a really wonderful um, way of doing things. And so I thought, okay, maybe we could make Carrollwood Day School the default home of the Champions League. And when I say default, because I thought in my thinking about it was, if you were the winner of the Champions League, then you should have the right to host the Final Four. You should have that right. Now, you don't have to take up that right. It could just default back to Carrollwood Day School, but you should have that right because you've earned it on the field of play. You've earned the right. Now, some schools wouldn't be able to do it. Hillsborough Public School is very limited, um, you know, in, in what they're allowed to do and so forth, but some schools could do it. Jesuit just put on a great Final Four uh, you know, just a month ago here because they won the Champions League. Wiregrass Ranch did it, David Wilson, the great, the great, amazing David Wilson, who is, you know, um, he has kept this whole thing going. We haven't gotten to his part of the story yet. He did one at Wiregrass Ranch. Uh, okay. So, proposal, Champions League, boom. We did it that first year. Uh, it was, it was done. And I'm trying to remember now. And my fog, my memory is a little bit foggy. But anyway, we did it that first year. Okay. Suddenly, uh, in an unforeseen way, I didn't expect to retire in 2018. I actually thought I'd still be there coaching with you all right now, uh, here in 2022. But. Sometimes uh, situations are taken out of your hands. And to make a long story short, I decided that I had to retire in 2018. Um, so then, I, of course, I worried that the Champions League and the TBT-10 would die when that, when that day came. But uh, I asked David Wilson to keep it alive. And you guys know what's happened since then. Because David, not only did he keep it alive, but he's extended it extended it a great deal and made it special and made it great and everybody knows Dave's a good guy and Dave's a fair guy but also Dave's an athletic director which is uh, you know you guys who coach high school soccer you know that there's no athletic directors who are also high school soccer coaches it just doesn't happen except Dave is so that's cool so he has the wherewithal he has the communication ability he has the love for high school soccer and, you know, he's just a great guy with the right attitude. And then he said, sure, I think this is really cool and I'll take it up. I don't have time. I don't know when I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll do it. And, of course, I related to that sentiment 
because that's where I was when it first started, which led me, of course, to that crazy year of waking up at four in the morning uh, every day. And I knew David would do that. I knew he would make that he would make that commitment to uh, to make all this happen, which is so cool because otherwise the Champions League would have died in 2018. So would TBT 10. We would have done it for a year and then it would have been over. So David has picked it up from there. The first Champions League was won by Eastlake. Getting uh, the schools to buy in was an effort, but everybody did buy in to that first Champions League. Uh, and Eastlake ended up winning. Okay, great. It was hosted at Wiregrass Ranch High School because David uh, David was there to do that. David, I guess, I guess that happened in the 2018-19 season, I guess. And I was already out from Carrollwood Day School by then, so he hosted that first Champions League. Okay. The second one, David moved it to uh, St. Leo to give it some splash, which is really cool. Fran Reedy, uh, former high school soccer coach at Gaither, athletic director at at, uh, I don't know exactly what his job is right now at St. Leo. I know for a while he was a soccer coach, then athletic director, and might even be higher up than that. I just don't know. But anyway, through David's connection with Fran and David being a, a Pasco County guy, of course, and St. Leo is in Pasco County. Not that that really matters. It just anyway, that's that that uh, idea germinated and happened. It was really cool. So. Then Jesuit won that one, and then Jesuit won it again, defended its championship during the COVID year. Um, and so Jesuit won on a two-time run. Uh, and then, oh, and by the way, David Wilson called me up one day and said, hey, uh, I think the thing needs a trophy, and I'm going to name it the Jim Hart Trophy. And I'm like, oh, I think I was going to start crying at that moment. I was like, oh, my gosh, that is so cool. Um, so I thank him for that and uh, greatly honored by it. Thank you, David. So Jesuit won that, that trophy two times, held on to it uh, for two years, and then brought it back up this year and put it back up for grabs. The idea was the trophy would be a traveling trophy to stay with the winning school for uh, you know, for the time, for the duration that they held it for the year, and then they'd bring it back up and try to win it again. Uh, this year, uh, as you may know, Osceola beat Jesuit in the semifinal at Jesuit. Jesuit hosted it. And um, in a penalty kick shootout. And then uh, in the final, Tampa Prep and Osceola played a fantastic game, like just an absolute cracker of a game amazing game and uh Tampa Prep ended up winning in a penalty kick shootout the championship so they're the current Champions League champions so summarize high school soccer used to be covered greatly it isn't anymore if they're not going to cover us we'll cover ourselves TBT 10 Facebook page coaches poll cool all right Champions League, unique, unique to soccer. Why can't we do it? We have district champions. You know, and the other cool thing is, it, for a while, although I don't think it's that way now, but for a while it was like not that big a deal to be the district champion. <clears throat> it was it was a big de deal in the sense that you got the trophy and the title of the district champion, but both teams have moved on. You didn't worry. Uh, you didn't worry if you lost. You, not... It wasn't a death sentence if you lost the cha the district final because you were still going to regionals. But by having to be the district champion, that's your way into the Champions League. Now suddenly the district final had a whole new meaning, which is cool. I thought that was really cool. So got that going. District championship, you know, Champions League, um, using the pole. In case there's not enough teams to cover all the spots in the Champions League, I mean, some teams might not want to come or might not be able to come. So then you can give legitimacy to the poll by 
going far, you know, it, let's say there's two open spots in the Champions League. Okay. You go to the last poll from the previous year and you, uh, and you say, um, who were the two best teams in this poll that didn't make it into the Champions League? Let's issue them invitations. And you work down the list until you have enough teams to fill out all the slots. Okay. So that's that. Uh, and that's how we got, you know, teams. Now there's 16 districts, actually. When we first started this, there were 12 in the Tampa Bay area. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. One, in the initial, uh, in the initial uh, proposal, there was also a proposal for a scholarship, which we never did anything about. But this year we did. And that's probably you know, kind of extend this tape way beyond what it should be already. So maybe in a different tape, but the 12th man scholarship, David is, uh, is critical to putting that all together. And Carlos Flores uh, is critical in, uh, in that uh, as well, critical. Um, Carlos Flores, by the way, is, is the guy responsible for all those fantastic graphics and Carlos, reached out to me way back at the beginning and I missed it. <laughs>